have them open to Psalm 3. And I want to make sure that you have a copy of the notes. Uh, the ushers have them in hand. If you'd like a copy of the notes to follow along, uh, they'll get those to you this morning. And also, if you need a, a copy of the scriptures, uh, if you need a Bible, uh, we have many and would love to get those into your hands uh, as well. If you wanted to let one of the ushers know and then... If you'd like to take that home as a gift from grace, uh, we would love that. Psalm chapter 3, or Psalm, no, Psalm 3, uh, we're in the midst of a mini-series called Poems with a Purpose, and you can find those on our website and also on our app. A while back, I shared with you uh, something that I did um, in the various, uh, very earliest days of uh, serving here at Grace, which began in 1991. Uh, for some reason, um, uh, for some reason, I, uh, after the service uh, one day, after one Sunday, at that time, the stage was not fixed like this. It was uh, four by eight by four inch platforms that were arranged uh, to give different elevations, and that was our choir loft and our stage. And I had it in mind that uh, it was time to change the stage. And so I just took it upon myself without consulting uh, my fellow elder, who was also our choir director, Glay McDonald, uh, about doing that. And I just went to it the rest of that afternoon, and I completely rearranged the stage. Well, it was about two nights later that I woke up in the middle of the night, wide awake and fully cognizant of my sin and realizing what I had done. Now, that may not sound like much to you, so you move some things, but what I did is I violated uh, and, and completely usurped the authority of my fellow elder and the choir director. And I also showed an incredible insensitivity to the members of our choir. And it was just clear as a bell. And so as that hit me, I, I, it was the middle of the night, as I said, and I... I went back to bed, um, but as you can imagine, I tossed and turned all night. I didn't, I didn't sleep after that point because I felt so bad, and I couldn't wait for the morning to come for me to go and talk to Glay and to make it right. So that's what I did the next morning, uh, went over to Glay and Jean McDonald's and confessed my sin and, and asked for forgiveness, and Glay responded with such grace and such love, and he forgave me. And you know, in that relationship for the years that followed, I never experienced anything but kindness and respect and uh, harmony with Glay because he had genuinely forgiven me, and we were at peace. However, that was not my relationship with the choir. Because rightly so, they felt devalued. Uh, they felt, um, they did not feel loved by me because of what I had done. And some, some forgave, uh, but others really struggled with that. And so I had a chilly relationship with the choir uh, for several years after that. And that was a consequence of my sin. That was my fault. And I had to live with it. But even as I lived that out, I did have a relationship of peace and freedom with Glay because of his forgiveness. I think as we head into Psalm 3, you're going to see the points of, of comparison here, as this is very similar to what David experienced in the midst of the consequences of his sin. In the, in the midst of his Suffering through the consequences of his sin, he had a peace and he had a freedom because he knew he was forgiven. If you have your Bibles open, you'll notice that the preface to Psalm 3, which was written by King David, reads, A psalm of David when he fled from Absalom, his son. David committed adultery with a woman named Bathsheba and then had her wife or her husband excuse me Uriah murdered 
He was confronted by the prophet Nathan, and David confessed his sin, and Nathan assured him that God had forgiven him, but he revealed that the Lord, that, that David was still going to suffer the consequences of his sin. The most immediate was that the child that was conceived of the adultery died. But Nathan went on to reveal that God was going to raise up evil against David from within his own home. And that came in the person of Absalom, his son, who mounted a violent coup, a violent rebellion against his father David to unseat him from the throne and to take the throne as his own. Now David having been confronted by Nathan with his sin of adultery and murder, wrote Psalm 51. And let me quote just part of Psalm 51 so you get a sense of David's remorse, David's grief, uh, the soul pain that he was experiencing as a result of his sin of adultery and murder. He wrote, Have mercy on me, O God, According to your steadfast love, according to your abundant mercy, blot out my transgressions. Wash me thoroughly from my iniquity and cleanse me from my sin. For I know my transgressions and my sin is ever before me. Purge me with hyssop and I shall be clean. Wash me and I shall be whiter than snow. Let me hear joy and gladness. Let the bones that you have broken rejoice. Hide your face from my sins and blot out all my iniquities. Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a right spirit within me. And God heard David's plea, and he forgave him and renewed him. But David still had to live through the consequences of his sin. As I mentioned, Absalom conspired against his father. The scriptures reveal in 2 Samuel that, that Absalom was incredibly handsome and charming. And he beguiled enough Israelites to mount a coup that drove King David out of Jerusalem, across the mountains, and across the Jordan River. And Absalom seated himself on the throne of his father, David. As he was running from Absalom, as he was literally running for his life, David wrote Psalm 3 that we're going to read this morning. And in it, he reveals his deep confidence that God is protecting him and that God will restore him to the throne. And that may seem presumptuous to us in light of his sin, how having committed adultery and murder as the king of Israel, how in the world can he be confident that God is still with him? That God is protecting him and that God will seat him once again on the throne. It sounds presumptuous to us, but actually what we will discover is that David had taken to heart what God had made known to him, that he was really forgiven and that he was really restored to God, and that God had not withdrawn his loving kindness from David, nor was God going to fail to keep his promises to David in the Davidic covenant concerning his throne. And so while David is suffering the consequences of his sin, he does so with a tremendous amount of peace and freedom because he knows in the deepest part of his soul that he's forgiven and restored to God. That makes all the difference in the world. David begins by explaining the situation, and as he does so, you'll notice that he, he doesn't express consternation or wonderment as to why he is suffering what he's suffering. The reason is because he knows why he's suffering. And so he's not complaining as if saying, God, where are you? God, why are you allowing me to happen? This ha to happen to me. He knows that he's suffering the consequences of his sin, and he accepts that. Notice with me verses 1 and 2 of Psalm 3. O Lord, how many are my foes? 
Many are rising against me. Many are saying of my soul, there is no salvation for him in God. And then the muse, what we think is a musical notation, Selah, and I give you the potential or what we think might be the meaning of that term in your footnotes. But you'll notice that Paul or that uh, David expresses what's happening to him. Many of are, are my foes, all of these that Absalom uh, has uh, influenced to conspire against David are rising up in rebellion against David and they're driving him out of the capital and they're driving him out of the country. Can you imagine how painful that was to David? Not that only that it was his son that was leading this coup, but that these were fellow Israeli citizens that were a part of his kingdom that he cared for, who were rising up and being deceived by Absalom. And one of the main deceptions is expressed here. What are David's foes saying about him? There is no salvation for him in God. Well, the term salvation simply means deliverance. And in this context, what would it mean for David to be delivered? It would be for him to be restored to the, to the throne. And what the people are saying, and I believe under the influence of Absalom, is that David will not be restored to the throne because God is against him. God is taking the throne away from David like he took the throne away from his predecessor, Saul. David's foes, influenced by Absalom, are saying, God is done with David. God has, uh, David has sinned, and God is punishing him and taking away the kingdom, the throne and the crown from David. There is no salvation for David in God. God is done with him. He's taking the kingdom away as he did for Saul. Notice David's response in verses 3 and 4. But you, O Lord, are a shield about me, my glory and the lifter of my head. I cried aloud to the Lord, and he answered me from his holy hill, Salah. Now David's a military man, right? And what piece of equipment does he draw on? The shield. And what does a shield do for a warrior? It protects. And David says, even though many are rising against me, many are saying God is done with me, yet God, you are protecting me. You are protecting me. And what's more, you are my glory and the lifter of my head. And that term lift, that verb in Hebrew, means literally to pick up and to lift up, but figuratively it means to exalt. And I believe in this context, this is David's response to what his enemies are saying about him. David is confident that God will once again lift his head to wear the crown. Because that's, David's, that's God's promise to David. And so David is assured that God is protecting him. David is confident that God will once again restore to him the throne of Israel and lift his head to once again wear the crown. He knows this because he's cried out to the Lord and the Lord has answered his prayer. And David is walking in the confidence of God's response to him, the confidence of God's promises to him, even in the midst of his consequences. In verses 5 and 6, David writes, I lay down and slept. I woke again, for the Lord sustained me. I will not be afraid of many thousands of people who have set themselves against me all around. How in the world could David sleep when he was literally on the run for his life with all of this uncertainty of the future? How in the world could he lay down and sleep in the midst of these circumstances? The answer, Psalm 51. David was living in the peace and freedom that comes from knowing that God 
has forgiven him completely. David was living in that peace and freedom of Psalm 51 that God had cleansed him and that God had renewed his relationship with David. Now see, this is counterintuitive because many of us, when we are suffering, we think God is against us. And if we think God is against us, we think God has not forgiven our sin. But what we're learning from the life of David is that God had completely forgiven David of his sin and renewed the relationship between he and David. And yet, it was part of God's discipline in David's life to allow him to suffer the consequences of his sin. But David was going through that suffering with peace and freedom because he really believed and clung to the truth that God had forgiven him. You know what, folks? This is true in our own lives. There are consequences for our sin. Particularly, as we see in, in David's case, for many of us, we live with guilt. And some of the sins that cause us the greatest depth of guilt are sexual in nature, sexual sin from our past. For some of us, we have fallen into the sin of adultery like David. And as a result, we've blown up our marriage. It ended in divorce. We have children that will not have a relationship with us because they're still angry and bitter. These are the consequences that we get into the situations where we find ourselves in addiction to alcohol or to drugs. That has consequences. That tears relationships apart some of which never heal in this life. And they are simply the consequence of our sin. For some of us, we break the trust, whether that's in our families, whether that's in a work situation. We lie, we steal, we do that which breaks people's trust in us, and there are consequences for that. There are people who will not trust us ever again. And we have to live with that. That's the consequence of our sin. But what we are seeing through the life of David is that we can genuinely repent, grieve that sin, turn from it, cry out to God, as we read in 1 John 1, 9, which I'll get to in just a moment, and be assured that God has forgiven us and have peace in our relationship with God even as we may be suffering the consequences of our sin. But we do so with peace and freedom in our relationship with God. Let me be clear that when we trust in Jesus Christ for salvation, the Bible tells us that God forgives all of our sin, past, present, and future. In fact, when Christ hung on the cross, Peter explains that all of our sin was placed in his body on the tree. And when he died there, all of your sin and all of my sin was paid for by the death of Jesus Christ on the cross. Judicially, that means that we are completely forgiven and there is nothing that God will ever bring up in the way of an accusation against us because the blood of his son has paid for it in full. Colossians tells us that he has taken the record of our debt out of the way. He nailed it to the cross. It's gone. There is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. So now, once we trust in the Lord Jesus Christ and we become sons and daughters of God, as we studied in Galatians, that relationship can never be broken because there is no sin that can ever separate us again from God. That's been removed. But, as in a family situation or a friendship, sin doesn't break the relationship, but it does affect the relationship negatively. It affects the fellowship. And this is what we now deal with in our day in and day out lives with God, is our fellowship with him. 
Are we walking in the light as he is in the light? Are we walking in truth and righteousness and goodness and love like he is? Or are we walking in the flesh and in the world and in self-centeredness, the old way of life? And see, if we are guilty of sinning against God, the antidote is not to get saved again. The antidote is to confess to agree with God that we are not walking in the light as he is in the light. John tells us in 1 John 1, 9, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. He then removes uh, the, he forgives us and restores us to fellowship with him. And that is what he wants for all of us who are his children. And some of us in this room are still living in bondage to guilt, to guilt over our sin. Now that can be because we have not confessed we have not yet agreed with God that we have sinned against him and that what we're holding on to is wrong. That can be the reason why we're still in guilt. And the antidote to that is to confess. Now, some of us have confessed and perhaps even confessed many times. And the problem is we're not really believing God has forgiven us when, in fact, he has. Christ died for that sin, whatever it may be. He died for it. He took it out of the way. He shed his blood. He was separated from the Father and took our spiritual death on himself on the cross. It's paid for. It's done. And when the Father says, if you will confess and agree to him, with him about your sin, that he will forgive you and cleanse you from all righteousness, he means it. Because he wants you to walk in fellowship with him in the light. He wants you to walk in peace and freedom with him. That's the heart of our Father. That's what we see here in David's relationship with God. That yes, he is suffering the consequences of his sin, but he is doing it in freedom and in peace and in the confidence that God is for him and not against him. And so he can lie down and sleep in the midst of these consequences. He can rest. Why? Because he is at peace with God. And he knows that God is at peace with him. You see, folks, here's a prescription for a good night's sleep. If you've sinned against God, confess it. Believe in his forgiveness and go to sleep. It's done. Your heavenly father doesn't hold grudges. He wants you to be able to sleep the sleep of peace and freedom because he's forgiven you. In verses 7 and 8, David writes, Arise, O Lord, save me, O my God, for you strike all my enemies on the cheek. You break the teeth of the wicked. Yow! I just read that. I just mm, wouldn't want to be one of them. Salvation belongs to the Lord. Your blessing be on your people. Selah. Who is David trusting to deliver him from Absalom? He says salvation comes from where? A great plan? The army that he's putting together? The new incredible weapon that he's developing? This massive, massive spear that can be launched from the east bank of the Jordan and hit Absalom in Jerusalem? Where does salvation come from? From the Lord. And so another reason why David is sleeping well is because he's trusting whom to fight his battle. He's trusting God to fight his battle. 
How many times are we tempted to fight our own battles when we come up against opposition? How many times are we tempted to take things into our own hands to get what we want? And so we fight our own battles, but that's when we are tempted most to sin, to battle according to the weapons of the world, to use lying and deceit, manipulation, in order to get our way. And that's when we're very vulnerable when we try and fight our own battles. That's when we are very vulnerable sinning against God and sinning against man. And here David is released from that because of his faith that God is for him and that God is fighting his battle. Do you have a battle in your life right now? Are you trusting in God that salvation is from the Lord? Is God powerful enough to handle your battle? Is he? Does he care about you? Okay, so does he care about the battle that you're in? All right, is he for you? Does he know what's best? Is it possible you don't know what's best in this battle and that perhaps you're going in the wrong direction? Does God have the power through his Holy Spirit to win the battle? Does he have the power to change your perspective if your perspective is wrong about the battle? Yeah, so he'll either win the battle or he'll change your heart and your perspective because you're not seeing it right. But either way, salvation is from the Lord if we will trust him and entrust to him our battles, as did David as he ran for his life from Absalom. You see, here's the truth. God loves you. He's for you. If you've sinned, confess it. Believe that he has really forgiven you and let him fight your battles. And that's how you keep your peace. And that's also how you sleep. I can sleep. I can sleep. Let's pray together. Father, thank you for preserving this song from King David. Help us if we have sinned to come in humility to you and to confess, agree with you concerning our sin, to turn from it and to embrace the truth that you forgive us, you are faithful to forgive us and you are faithful to cleanse us from all unrighteousness so that we might walk before you in freedom and peace. We might walk in the light and not in the darkness. Help us to trust you to fight our battles, that you know best, that you are all-powerful, that you are able, and that we don't need to take things into our own hands. We don't need to use the weapons of the world. We don't need to use the weapons of the flesh, but we can rest in you. And Father, I pray for those here, and I'm So grateful for each one who has come this morning and for each who will hear this study. Pray for anyone who is still separated from you by their sin, that your spirit will open their eyes to see that Jesus has paid the price when he died on the cross, sinless himself, fully God, fully man, that he paid the price for all of our sin that we might be completely forgiven and completely restored to you for all eternity. I pray that you would open their hearts and minds to accept your gift of eternal life through Jesus Christ. I pray this in his name. Amen.